Um, so thank you, and uh, we have a good crowd, so this is exciting. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in open educational resources and the evidence base and the research, so I think these, the session is well-timed, and uh, thank you to David Wiley and Open University Netherlands for putting all this together in Ken Um So what I wanted to do was I wanted to talk about OER goals. And partly this goes back to <clears throat> the early days of open educational resources and at the Hewlett Foundation what we had kind of determined of what we thought the field of open knowledge might be. So this was 2001, 2002, 2003 that began to evolve. And at the very beginning it was really about equalizing access to knowledge. It was putting resources, content out there in the world to see if anyone would use it, to see if there was a thirst, to see if people would pick it up and try to iterate on it and reuse and remix. And there really wasn't a clear answer at that time why we might think now that it was very clear that people would. It really wasn't clear whether that would happen. And there wasn't a model for education, which really required a cultural and dynamic shift. But what I really want to focus on is the second goal, which we um, all held. And now I see Mike is here, Mike Smith, who worked, uh, we worked together at ULIT. And this was really the goal we had also identified of leveraging openness as a vehicle to improve teaching and learning. So it was the so what question. It doesn't matter if we put content out there and it's freely available if it doesn't really make any difference to teaching and learning. And I think this is the point in the evolution of the field where we're all now becoming very focused and very centered because what we want to know is what is the so what? We don't want it to just be certainly a passing fad. Um, for me personally, um, my context in openness came from the ULIP Foundation. Um, I <clears throat> worked with Mike and invested in a number of the early open educational resources projects and tracked them over the um, eight years. So very much at the beginning of seeding ideas, trying to test what would work. Early on, we thought we only needed to seed content. We didn't want to worry about infrastructure. We thought others would take care of it. And then pretty quickly realized we had to move into Creative Commons licensing and other background uh, piping issues that were really important for the field to grow. Um, I, so I've moved from one hill at the Hewlett Foundation over to another hill, which uh, I can actually see my old building from my new building um, on Stanford campus. And it's the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. And at the Carnegie Foundation, every 10 or 12 years, a new president is selected to build a new agenda and a new project of work. And the new president there is Tony Bright. He started about a year and a half ago, and I joined him as his first kind of senior partner to help design innovation and openness into the project that's been built. And so we have a new experiment there built around openness and data sharing and research. The project in particular focuses on community colleges. In the United States, community colleges serve 47% of students who are in higher education. So it's the largest percent of students go to community colleges. It is the, um, the school of last choice, second choice, multiple choices, really open access for students. That's the system that's been built. And while we're developing, the work itself is the development of a new R&D infrastructure for education. What we did is try to select problems of critical importance in the current educational system to work on in trying to design a new R&D infrastructure. So this quote, I think, captures what we're trying to do in community colleges. We want to help community colleges build new pathways worthy of mathematics, worthy of their students, and worthy of their institutional missions. And in this way, there's also been a shift for the Carnegie Foundation. Uh, the Carnegie Foundation has traditionally um, focused on more um, R1 type research universities, um, higher ed, more of a think tank on a hill. The work has become much more applied in this new, new evolution under President, under President Brake. Um, just to look at data, because it's so important to understand where we are, to understand where we want to go to. One of the organizations that we've learned from at the Carnegie Foundation as we think about a new structure for R&D and education is looking at the healthcare industry. So a group of the senior staff spent a week on a case study out at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Cambridge, Mass, and Massachusetts. And they've spent over 20 years building an organization that is focused on the science of performance improvement, particularly focused in healthcare. Um, and in particular, in medicine, you think about survival, survival graphs, survival data. So we tried to think about, well, if we apply this to community colleges, what does some of the data look like? So this was just an early exploration of when we do that, what do we see when we look at the likelihood of student success coming into a community college? So we can see in um, the fall, you have 100% students who are enrolled 
By the spring, we dropped to 70 percent. By the following fall, we're down to 57 percent, so we're almost at half. And then by the following fall, shortly after two years, we're down to 42 percent of the students who are enrolled are still enrolled and engaged. So this is a huge loss of resources, huge loss of effort, huge loss of confidence of students. Um, and as I say, if it was a business, we would probably just shut it down. So we're looking for a new pathway. And as we look to community colleges, one of the clear pipeline issues for students is what they call remedial math. So it's the developmental ed courses before they act, students are able actually to um, access the transfer level courses. And this is the current structure for students to get into the transfer level courses. So we move, and typically we start in third or fourth grade, but many students are not prepared by the time they come to community colleges. You start with arithmetic, pre-algebra, you move to elementary algebra, you then move down to intermediate algebra, and then begin to move, and this is all of a pipeline that we've structured for calculus. Uh, essentially, we're directing every student in math for calculus. Um, and, and in a way where we used to direct every student towards Latin. And I took Latin for a few years, and I expect some people here did as well, but it's not really a language I use with that much um, uh, in an everyday way. Same thing, I was a math major. I took calculus. I never want to preclude anyone from the joy of taking calculus. If that's a subject you want to take and you see it's going to be part of your work, that's fine. But as we look to the 21st century, as we look at the humanities, as we look at a lot of the allied health fields, we really don't need this competence in calculus. We need uh, competence in statistics in a much more significant way. And I'm just adding some more data numbers to look at what do we know about the students who do enter this pathway and what their success rate. So if you enter in the intermediate algebra at the 44%, you have a 44% chance of completing the sequence and getting into the transfer level course. But if you start two courses down in the elementary algebra world, there's only a 29% chance of completion, very low. And if you're down in arithmetic pre-algebra, again, 16% of students, so we have and in this developmental math sequence, we know up to 70% of students in community colleges go into this developmental math sequence before they go to transfer level. So we have a lot of structural institutional problems that are going to hinder the success of students. So our um, work at the Carnegie Foundation is to try to build an alternative pathway, not to replace the current pathway because it certainly serves the needs and meets some students who are successful, but also to say that there's going to be another way that we can look at this and there's another way that we can begin to try to address the problems for students. So what we'd like to do is take the students who are at least at the elementary algebra level and build a one-year course so there aren't so many breaks in the courses. That's a sequential course that takes them to and through the first year of statistics. And not only does it build statistical competency and quantitative reasoning, it does build up the algebra competencies that are needed um, in this particular sequence as well. But we're also thinking clearly about how we think about language and learning, which is a huge hindrance for many students who are in the community college um, institutions. They're often first generation students. Um, and even if English is not their second language, it is at times that English, the command of English is not as strong as it could be to really do the strong academic work. So we're building language and literacy. Guadalupe Valdez from Stanford University is part of our team. Secondly, we're also trying to build in what we call do college. Uh, someone mentioned somewhere something, about, I think it was maybe in the notes from the high school about how math had been so painful before. For many, many students, there's just this fear of math. I don't know how to do it. I'm not good at it. You either know ma you're either good or you're not. And what we really need to do is rebuild the confidence of students that not only can they do math, but they can do science. And they can do anything they really put their, their head to. And so how do we build confidence? How do we help them build persistence? How do we help them with grit and tenacity, and how do they think about them as successful learners in their life journey ahead. Um, so the fundamental idea is that we're building a networked improvement community, so that we need to reorganize the structures and work as in a much more synergistic way to overcome this problem, which many community colleges have worked on in various um, aspects of the country, but always kind of looking at a part of the problem. So we're trying to take on what I sometimes call the whole elephant. So in education, we typically have practice. We have faculty or teachers who sit alone, who are in the classroom, who work individually with students, who understand what students know and don't know. Um, 
but they're not the researchers. And they often don't have an opportunity to interact with researchers. And the researchers tend to sit at academic institutions, uh, terrific dissertations, theses, lifelong research. But in many ways, the researchers, when they, find, when they do learn, it doesn't translate quickly back into the classroom for the teacher to take that tool or skill and bring it back to the direct connection that they have with the students. And when we think about the third significant player in the space, we think about commercial partners who, again, sit outside of the classroom, sit outside of the research. They're very good at marketing. They think of great products. But it isn't always tied to the science, the learning sciences. Um, they think about scale in ways that both faculty and researchers don't. And there's this combined expertise that we really need to bring to the table, what we call the design table as we think about our work. So at Carnegie, we've created a hub. And the hub provides kind of the analytics and the gel to try to bring these three teams together. For our first networked improvement community, we're focusing on statistics. We have 20 community colleges in five states who launched this summer. Um, who will be part of this first networked improvement community. This year is a co-development year where we are not developing the content and giving it to them to then implement. We're, develop we're very much seeding the content, but in very early stages, asking them to take it and test it in their classrooms, help iterate on it, and help us build the content so that in time it's co-ownered by all. The researchers sit side by side, so as the faculty have problems with student misperceptions, there's still clear areas that we don't understand about why students have difficulty learning, and that the researchers can work very closely with the faculty. And then we're trying to think hard about how we bring the commercial partners in, how we can bring some of that expertise to help us as we move along as well. At the same time, we can't build just from the grassroots. We can't just build from these community colleges. We have to think about the whole policy realm, the ecosystem that exists. So in developing in this new statistics pathway and developing what we think the outcomes are for the statistics pathway, again, it wasn't just Carnegie building them by themselves with our 20 community colleges. We engaged the American Mathematical Association, the American Statistical Association, the Lodge Professional Association, players in the community colleges. And we all came around the table and said, if we want to develop this, what are the outcomes that we need to look for? And so we've co-developed the outcomes, which will help us kind of in a top-down, bottom-up level of bringing this whole uh, kind of infrastructure to action as we move along. So to get a little bit at it, um, and this goes back now kind of to OER, where we think about OER as an asset. So this, is, I think, has been one of the challenges in the field. Is OER simply a resource? Is it a textbook? Is it a curriculum? Or is it a process? And if it's a process, what is the improvement cycle for that process, and how do we think about it? So what we're developing is a one-year statistics course. It's going to have an open kernel instructional kernel, which will have a CC BY license. And the kernel will go out and will be put into practice with our participating community colleges. They will collect evidence on student learners. So this is, again, very data-driven evidence. Does this instructional um, materials work with this student under this set of circumstances for this set of learning outcomes. So we're looking very clearly at who the student is when they come in the door, what are their cognitive and non-cognitive skills, what is the learning pathway that they take through the statistics course, and then what outcomes do they hit. So not only does it work in general, binary yes, no, but who does it work for whom under what context. So we collect the evidence on student learning. As a group, as a collaboratory, we reflect on practice and instructional materials. We then, the collaboratory refines it. We don't do it alone. We don't do it individually. Faculty, it's part of the wisdom of crowds, cloud so crowdsourcing. Everyone shares their ideas and innovations. And again, we put it back into practice at the same time ref refining the open kernel. So as this module is built out, we kind of think about it as a spine. And as new and better improved pieces of the spine are improved, we can switch them in and out, but still have this very holistic spine in which we have data collected for student learning. Um, and just kind of closing and, um, and thinking there's a lot obviously behind this. There's a lot of work on the, the website. We are building the ship as it's um, flying or sailing. I guess it's a plane in flight. Um, we will be launching next September with the community colleges. So the articulation issues, it's going into the course um, guidelines in the colleges now. We're thinking about um, the accreditation issues also with the four-year colleges of which they're fine-tuned to. We have many colleges, interestingly, who are geared up to scale to other states. Um, 
And so we clearly have hit a chord about what we think is not working in the current system and what we need to continue to work on. But as we think about networked improvement and openness, um, there's another differentiator that I think we have to be careful of. And part of this is how do we think about improvement vis-a-vis -vis innovation? Are they different? Do they have to be the same? What kind of space do you create? So while I think in this collaboratory we have space for innovation and there will be people, because this open kernel is out there, there's going to be people innovating in ways we can't even imagine. And hopefully those lessons learned will come back into the collaboratory itself. And in another way, too, with the research, what we hope to have is the open data and seed a lot of young researchers who would be interested in actually building on and researching the data that, that we have as well. So how do we bring new researchers in? And how do we actually manage some system of faculty are saying they're having this type of problem with students in the statistics pathway, and we haven't really been able to grapple with it. So if we identify the set of problems that we really like to work on, real-life problems that teachers are grappling with, who, what researchers might be able to pick that up, look at the data, help us think about that, and then feed that information back so it becomes a much more holistic cycle? Um, as we think about all this and all the student data and the open data, clearly we have to think about the confidentiality of student data and how we move that forward. And lastly, how do we really think about the uh, focus on student learning? Because all of this, all that we do with engagement, with uh, technology, which, which is so terrific at Utah State University, with all the innovations we've seen in the many different open educational resources projects throughout the world, um, <clears throat> ultimately it's about student learning. Because if it's not about student learning, it's going to be the passing fad. So unless we really keep ourselves to that high benchmark and to that high quality, we have to prove our effectiveness in ways um, that we can now because we have a digital footprint and we have that capacity to do it. So with that, I'll close and open for questions. Thank you very much, Kathy. And do we have some questions? Okay, let's see if I can get this over to you. Hi, I'll try to keep it short. Um, so, so far this morning, I've seen a lot of emphasis on uh, quantitative types of teaching, learning, and assessment. Uh, you mentioned the word data-driven. I'm wondering where the space is for qualitative citizenship, liberal arts, humanities type projects in this kind of environment that you're building? So I think um, ultimately I think that's where the largest impact will be on the open materials because that's where the most creativity is. It's in some ways easier for us to start in the math and sciences because of the quantitative nature of it. Um, I think the types of projects and the deeper learning that we're looking for the 21st century skills and the collaboration and the project-based work completely builds on the non-quantitative side. Um, within our project, even because we are focused on statistics, though we're working on very conceptual rather than rote and procedural problems. So even thinking about how we're going to be collecting data from the students of the student work is a huge challenge for us because we expect the students to write out their thinking and their answers. And so why it's a statistics problem, the answers and the assessment we're not going to have a very simple rubric, in particular in this first iteration of identifying, ah, the students mastering the skills. So I think we have a long way, still in many ways, to go, but I don't think um, it's so problematic that we can't get there. And I, th I don't think it's an either or. Sometimes it's a first step um, where we can kind of jump in a little bit more quickly and provide some evidence. But ultimately, what we'd love to see is that this becomes a model in, all, in the way that all these different exemplars and projects become models that we can then iterate to other content domains. And I think ultimately, the content domains become much more interdisciplinary as well. So the overlap will blur. Great. Any other questions for Kathy? Um, I have I have one. Um, so I'm uh, I'm not sure how far along you are in terms of uh, the mechanisms for the collaboratory to start sharing uh, mm -hmm. the resources, but um, something that I'm interested in um, in terms of openness is um, how or are you addressing within the actual research process people sharing things early and often versus you know, kind of what we see as the more conventional academic process, which is storing it all up till you're ready to publish and yet not getting the openness and the collaboration in the wider community that, you know, of the ad hoc people who can take advantage of things at an early state. Right. So academic community tends to be very slow 
Uh, we're very aware of that. It's been a cultural shift with the academics who are in-house working at Carnegie as well. There is a discomfort of putting things out that aren't perfect because the world will see it, even though we're saying it's version 1.0 and we're going to iterate and we're just going to um, put the seeds on it. So I think that's something that we as an organization are trying to learn on, learn about. Uh, we're, our m mantra is to fail fast, fail often, but quickly reiterate. Um, and I think this is part of the challenge that we expect uh, teachers to have this kind of comfort. But then as we also step into that space, we have a Carnegie name. Fac you know, we have um, faculty at Dana Center, University of Texas, Austin. We have Jim Stigler at UCLA. There's a certain quality benchmark that they have built into their work their whole life. And this is a very, very different mechanism. And mm -hmm. so as a collective group, we're, we are moving that way. But the cultural differences are enormous. And I think we really just have to engage in a different way than we have previously. Other folks? All right. Well, you get to, to leave two minutes early. Um, <laughs> so please join with me in thanking Kathy Thank once you. more.